I get to present the Hazel Frank Gluck Award, which is named in honor of a woman whose career in the New Jersey Assembly and in multiple roles in the cabinet of Governor Tom Kane remains an inspiration to future women leaders. We present this award annually to acknowledge the accomplishments of a new leadership alumna who has emerged as an inspiring advocate, candidate, office holder, and or community leader. That is, a woman who is following in Hazel Gluck's footsteps. This year, it is my honor to present this award to Tiffany Palmer. Tiffany participated. Oh. <laughs> Tiffany participated in the second year of the new leadership program in 1992, which actually makes me feel extremely old. Uh, while she was a student at Northern Arizona University, and in those early days, uh, we had students from schools across the country, and they came here not for six days, but for two weeks. So it was a real investment of time on the students' part. Upon graduating, Tiffany attended the Joint Law and Public Policy Program at Rutgers School of Law in Camden and the Blaustein School at Rutgers University here in New Brunswick. And she was also a graduate fellow here at the Eagleton Institute of Politics. Since then, Tiffany has dedicated herself to a life of public service. She has built a career devoted to ensuring the legal equality of LGBTQ families through a focus on family law, adoption, and assisted reproductive technology law. She has worked on numerous cases related to the rights of LGBTQ parents, as well as those who conceive through assisted reproductive technologies. And she has argued in front of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court on the question of expanding the legal definition of parenthood. In addition to her own practice, Jerner and Palmer, PC, Tiffany serves as the director of the Family Law Institute of the National LGBT Bar Association. And this year, Tiffany ran to serve as a judge on the Court of Common Pleas in Philadelphia, and I am thrilled to tell you that on May 21st, she won her primary election, and she is now the Democratic nominee for that position. <laughs> And she would like all of you to change your party registration over to Philadelphia, your voter <laughs> registration. Now, I have to tell you that Tiffany is everything we hoped for when we first designed the new leadership program. She is kind of our dream poster child for this program and its success. A student who comes to us with an interest in politics, and after participating in the program, doors begin to open, and she pursues a path that leads her to politics government, and a life of making a difference. We have been watching her career progress, and I can think of no better alum for this program to receive the Hazel Frank Luck Award than Tiffany. So it is really my honor to present this year's winner of the Hazel Frank Luck Award and tonight's keynote speaker, Tiffany Palmer. A new leadership alumna who has used the knowledge and experience gained from the program to inspire others and to make a difference. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> and now I turn this very hot thank microphone you. over to you. <laughs> thank you. But you have lots of water here. So. Oh, wonderful. That's my water then. That is your water. Okay, good. And this is my phone. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you to the Center for American Women in Politics for this program. Thanks for new leadership. Um, thank you to Susie Wilson for endowing this program for generations to come. Um, and to Hazel Frank Gluck for her work that created this award. And um, I'm just so honored to be here tonight. And when Debbie called me and asked me to potentially give the keynote address the week before my primary election, <laughs> Um, I couldn't say no, but I also said, wow, I really better win. <laughs> so, no pressure, right? 
Yes, I, you would have taken me either way, but it's a lot better to come here as someone who's recently won a primary election, I have to say. Um, it's just such an honor for me to come back here 27 years after the first time that I walked through these doors at Eagleton um, to attend the second new leadership program back in 1992. And I was sitting exactly where you are now that summer, uh, wondering what my future had in store for me. Um, but before you can figure out what your future has in store for you, you have to figure out who you are. Um, and what you care about. And for me, as a 20-year-old college student, um, and even later as a law student, I didn't really envision running for judge or possibly even for public office as an option for me. Um, because at age 20, for me, I was just starting on a journey of self-discovery. And we often go off to college um, as, the as the people that our parents and our communities tell us we are. Um, and for me, as someone who was raised in Arizona in a very conservative community, I was struggling with my identity. Um, I was raised as in a Republican household um, in a very conservative religious community. And in high school, I was very interested in politics. I volunteered for Senator John McCain um, when I was in high school. And I was raised to believe that Ronald Reagan was the best president we ha could have ever had. <laughs> Um, we were very, very excited about Reagan in the 80s. Um, and I was elected to the Student Senate in uh, college when I first began. I was still interested in politics when I first began college. But I also started to realize something else about myself when I left my parents' home and was in college. Um, I realized that I was different and that I might even be gay. And this seemed incompatible for me um, with, po with the political life that I saw, that I was raised in, um, coming from a Republican background. And I didn't really see this as something that was reconcilable. And at the time when I was coming out in the early 90s, um, being gay was still really associated with the AIDS crisis. It was seen as something that was a dangerous and lonely lifestyle choice. Um, when I first started realizing that I might be gay, I had never even met an out lesbian who had a family. I had never met someone who was gay who had children um, or even a professional career. Um, so I repressed that part of me and struggled with how I could be my authentic self, self and still have any hope of a life in public service. Um, for me, the summer of 1992 was transformative. Um, it started here at New Leadership when I attended the New Leadership program, and it ended where the rest of my summer I went to Alaska to work in a salmon processing plant uh, alone. And I knew that in order to find myself and who I really was, I had to remove myself entirely from my upbringing and influences and discover who I was truly on my own. And I did. I learned a lot about myself that summer that really led me to who I am today. Um, through the new leadership program, I met amazing women leaders from all over the country um, from different political perspectives. It was so amazing to meet the faculty and residents and to be able to speak one-on-one -on -one with women who held elected office and had taken their own path and get to know them on a personal basis. I also met people who were living their authentic lives as out LGBT people and were happy and professionals. Um, I learned about activism in a new way and I took those lessons back with me to college when I returned. And what I came with, away with that summer was a confidence that I could be true to myself, even if it was hard. And I don't know how I was chosen for the program, honestly, um, but the fact that someone saw my potential as a leader at a time when I didn't necessarily even see that in myself really meant everything to me. That someone believed in me enough to send me here and to give me some tools to, be, to take this to uh, back with me and to help me, guide me along my way. Uh, when I returned back to college, um, I became very active in um, women's rights groups as well as uh, the LGBT group on my campus. Um, I helped organize one of the first Take Back the Night marches in 1993 at my college at a time when date rape on college campus was a huge issue and still is today. Um, and that was an honor to be involved in that uh, program. Um, and I also, <coughs> joined uh, with the LGBT rights group and organizing uh, around the campus community. Um, the Fight the Right group was a huge issue and we were working with the National Lesbian and Gay Task Force to organize groups in college campuses around the country. 
But I also knew that um, believing in myself didn't mean I had to change who I was, but that I felt that I had to change the laws that made it hard to be who I was, to be an out LGBT person. And I also realized something else um, about my career path. When I started college, I began college as a journalism major. Um, I believed that I could report and inform society about important things. And I began to realize that I didn't want to be a bystander telling the stories. I wanted to be part of making the change that is the story. And I felt compelled to explore more opportunities about activism and public service. And that's really what led me to pursue law school. I took the LSAT my senior year and decided that this would be my path. I knew I wanted to pursue a career in social justice and law reform. And for me at that time, as someone who was coming out in a society where the rights of LGBT people were so restricted, I really wanted to be part of the movement to change that. And I chose Rutgers Law School and I chose Eagleton's joint degree program uh, with law and public policy and returned here again in 1996 to get my master's degree. And in 1994, when I started law school, um, Ellen DeGeneres wasn't even out yet. Okay, that's, that we're going way back. Uh, there were no gay characters on TV sitcoms. This is before Will and Grace even. Um, no state in the country had same-sex marriage. This was not even something that people were even thinking about. Um, sodomy laws were still legal. It was still legal um, to, put some, to criminalize consensual same-sex sexual conduct. Um, and for me, learning that was, in my first semester of law school, I realized that that was the law of our country at the time, that that was still the case. Um, so for me, it was also a choice to be out in law school, and that was hard. But I knew that being true to myself meant doing that anyway, and taking the risks that came with that choice. And I decided to spend my summers working on the issues that I cared about the most, so I worked uh, with an internship at Lambda Legal on the first same-sex marriage case that was in Hawaii um, in 1996. And then I was able to work at the ACLU National Headquarters the following summer. And that led me to be able to pursue a career after graduation in LGBT civil rights work. I started working on cases immediately out of law school. And I received a fellowship from Equal Justice Works and National Fellowship Program to create my own social justice project. I was given a grant to create a program about an issue that I cared about. And for me, I decided to, to create a program called the Family Rights Project to represent low-income LGBT people in Philadelphia's family court system. And I knew this was the work that I wanted to do, but I followed this path against the advice of some very well-meaning people. Um, even in that time in 1998, it still wasn't considered safe or a career, a good career move to necessarily be out on your resume. And I was given a lot of advice that this would be something that would ruin my opportunities in law and ruin my opportunities to make a living if I was actually out on and worked at um, out LGBT rights organizations. But I, but I really knew that this was the work that I wanted to do, and it gave me a chance to make a real difference in the lives of people that needed it most. Um, one of the first cases I worked on involved a transgender teen girl who was housed in a juvenile detention center and denied her basic human dignity when she was housed with an all-male population. Um, but the worst treatment actually wasn't from her fellow residents, it was from the staff that was supposed to protect her. Um, and we helped get her appropriately housed and we also helped implement a mandatory LGBT training for the um, de juvenile detention center workers who just treated these young people with such disdain, it was, it was horrifying. Um, I was also able to work on a case for a man whose life partner of 20 years lay in a coma following a terrible car accident. Um, he was denied access to him in the hospital and he was denied the right to make medical decisions for him because they were not married. Um, and this was before marriage equality. So I represented him in a guardianship case to provide him with those basic rights, even in the absence of a marriage. And following my dream to work in the field of LGBT rights, I also had the opportunity to meet someone else who shared my passion for this work, um, my life partner and my wife, Lee Carpenter, who's here with me tonight. <laughs> um, <laughs> and our wonderful daughter, Ellie, <laughs> who's also here. Because um, one thing I learned is that when you're true to yourself and you pursue a path that really matters to you, 
Um, you not only find rewarding work, but you, find, you may find your perfect match. Um, you'll find other people on the same journey and the same path who share your passions. And I'm just so grateful to have them here with me tonight by my side as they have been um, through this campaign, <laughs> which has been a challenge. <laughs> um, I left nonprofit work after five years in Open Journal and Palmer PC in 2003. And starting a small business and starting a law firm is hard. Uh, many people told me that it was a very financially risky move and that most small business fail. Of course, I was working as a nonprofit lawyer, so I felt like, what do I have to lose? <laughs> when you're talking about the pay scale there, I figured it couldn't really get much lower, but it actually did. <laughs> so, um, so starting a business was rough. I mean, our furniture didn't arrive on time. We set up by sitting in camping chairs in our office with our laptops on TV trays. Um, and we took whatever cases would walk through the door, literally, and so we did the mailman's divorce, um, and we did our FedEx, FedEx guy's child support case. We, we did it all. Um, and I wondered, I began to wonder, you know, switching over into private practice from um, an LGBT civil rights focus, if I would really be able to still make a difference in social justice work. Um, working in the private sector, would I still be able to make social change? And just within a few weeks of opening our office, um, I received a call from a woman in Florida, I'll call her Kim, and she was a fellow attorney like me. Um, she had more experience, a few more years experience than me, and she was looking for representation in a, in a co possible custody case in Pennsylvania. And she told me her story um, that she and her partner Jennifer had had a child together and that her partner Jennifer was the birth mother. And together they selected an anonymous sperm donor, they lived together, they co-parented that little girl, um, her name was Jessica, for five years. And at that time in Florida, there was no such thing as second parent adoption, there was no way that my client um, could have uh, secured her parental rights to that child. Um, and one night Jennifer told Kim that she met someone else and she was leaving her. She moved out a week later and took Jessica. And at first, my client, uh, Kim, saw her every weekend, and then it was reduced to every other weekend, and then it was one weekend a month. And then um, Jennifer called Kim and told her that she had remarried, and that she'd married a man who was going to legally adopt um, Jessica. And uh, Jennifer and her new husband changed Jessica's last name to the one that she had shared with Kim to her husband's last name. And then she called her and said that they were moving to a small town in central Pennsylvania with her new husband and that she wouldn't be seeing Jessica anymore. Um, that it was too confusing for her since her new husband was now the father and that there was no place for Kim in her life. Um, and she was utterly devastated. So she called me and wanted to know if we could sue for custody. And this would be my first interstate custody case, and this would be one of the first cases in Pennsylvania to really um, test that issue. And it was definitely the first case in this small central Pennsylvania town. So I filed our custody complaint and served it um, on the other side, and we were given a response of um, objections based on standing. And if you, a lot of people in here are interested in law school, if you go to law school, you'll learn that standing means the right even to access the court, okay? It's, there's no higher stakes in a custody case than standing because losing in court doesn't mean that you don't have primary custody or that you have to share the holidays and you don't get the ones you want. It means that you leave the courtroom a legal stranger to that child, that not because you're unfit and not because you're a bad parent, just because the law doesn't see your relationship as existing with your family on an equal basis to others. And so we prepared for our day in court and I put in exhibit tabs on Mother's Day cards, a child's drawing of her family, and Kim, because I was representing a lawyer, had to second guess all my exhibits and my order of things, but we worked it out. Um, and I don't think I've ever been so afraid as I was in court that day because I knew what a loss would mean for Kim. I knew it would mean she would never see her daughter again. Uh, but I had to get beyond that fear and we had to get through it anyway. And I'm glad to say that we won that day. Yes. And after, uh, <laughs> and after, <laughs> thank you. And after many, many months with no contact with her child, they were finally reunited. Um, and a few years ago, um, I received an email from Kim with a picture of her and Jessica cooking together in their kitchen. Uh, she was no longer a little kindergartner. She's now a high schooler. Um, and she sp has spent every summer with Kim from that day in court forward to, to present. Um, and for me, that's really what my work was all about. 
Um, and even in private practice, I was able to help make that kind of impact in someone's life. Um, and during my time practicing law, I've realized that the cases that are most meaningful for me are not necessarily the ones that you read about in the headlines. Um, they're private victories and closed courtrooms, but they are the cases that involve children and who has the right to be called their parents. And oftentimes in, in our modern society, these questions are complex, um, especially for same-sex parents. As you look at what makes someone a parent, is it, is it biology, is it adoption, is it in the intent to be a parent, or is it simply the act of parenting a child, whether or not you're related by blood? And 15 years after Kim's case, I'm still, I've still been working on these types of cases. Um, in my most recent work, I've been working on it in the issues of um, modern families who are conceived through assisted reproductive technology, but I've also represented many other types of families, kinship caregivers, grandparents who are raising their children, aunts and uncles who are called, called mom and dad because they've stepped up to do the hard work of the parenting, and step-parents who've even gone above and beyond, even the biological parents. Um, and what I've learned that the law has the power to create and protect families and some of my greatest joys in my career have been celebrating the legal recognition of all these kinds of families. But most of the cases that come through our family court are not celebrations. And many of the cases I've handled in my career are cases where people face losses closest to their hearts, their children, and their loved ones. Um, people facing court cases like this are distraught. They're emotional, and rightfully so. Um, people are often at the worst point in their lives when they enter the doors of a family court building. And they deserve to be heard, they deserve justice, and they deserve compassion. And that is where my career is now starting to take a different path. Um, for me, I have reached the point of the 20 year mark in my career, if you can believe it. Um, and 20 years is really, for me, it was a time of reflection and assessment. And I've realized after 20 years that I've accomplished many of the goals that I set for myself as a young public interest lawyer just starting out in this work. Um, I've had the opportunity to represent many different kinds of people through my work, from some of the most vulnerable members of our society to even some of the wealthiest. Um, and I've had the chance to make real positive changes in the lives of my client and work on cutting edge cases that have changed the laws of Pennsylvania and New Jersey by advancing civil rights and expanding the definition of what it is to be a family. And I could certainly stay the course and keep doing what I've been doing, but uh, for me, this 20 year mark also comes at a time in our democracy where people are losing faith in our systems of government and where our judiciary in particular faces a crisis of confidence around the country. Um, and we're living at a time where everyone should be looking at themselves and wondering, am I doing enough? Am, am I doing enough to make a positive change in our democracy? Because if there was ever a time to step up, now is definitely the time. Um, and all over the country, at every level of government, we're seeing more women and more LGBT people step up for public office, whether it's at, as a county clerk, or as President of the United States, a candidate for President of the United States, people are answering this call for public service. Um, in 2018, we saw a record number of women elected to Congress. I say that's a start. <laughs> uh, because women's voices in political spaces make a difference, and our perspectives matter. Um, and we should aspire for an executive branch, a legislative branch, and a judiciary to really truly reflect the beautiful diversity of this country. Um, so I believe that now was the time for me to step up to run for judge, and I decided to run last spring. Um, I gathered as much information as I could from people who've successfully done this in the past. I began interviewing people I knew who I respected as judges and, and interviewed them about their own experiences and started to chart my own course. And while I received a lot of support and a lot of encouragement, I also faced the naysayers who said it couldn't be done. Um, and it reminded me of when people said I shouldn't be out on my resume in 1998, or that starting a law firm was too financially risky of a venture. But if you have a dream and you have a vision of what you want to do, you have to move past the negativity. It will always be there. Um, and that's what I did. But it wasn't always easy to stay positive. Um, running for office, you constantly face negative messages. Um, the ones that I faced included, 
Um, you can't win because your name is too far down on the ballot. There were only six positions open. There were 28 names on the ballot. Mine was number 23. And people said, well, the number one and two position always wins, so that means you're really running for only four slots. So everyone else was competing for those four. Um, I also heard that you can't win because the Democratic Party uh, did not endorse you. And in our city of Philadelphia, the Democratic Party City Committee does control a lot of power, and they did not endorse me. I heard that you can't win because you don't have enough money. I had about half as much as some of the other candidates that were running. And I was told to drop out of the race by people who claim to be experts in the process. Um, but I didn't. And I believed in myself, and I believed in the campaign team that we had put together. Um, and we were not just being idealistic, we were being realistic with looking at statistics and deciding to run a real grassroots progressive campaign in a different way, uh, in a way that's very unusual for judicial races, and run it much more similarly to how city council candidates run, with real information to voters. Because if we believed if they had the real information about who the candidates were, they wouldn't just rely on the luck of the numbers and where your name falls on the ballot. Um, and fortunately, it worked. <laughs> so I'm now one of the Democratic Party nominees for the November general election. Um, and in, I'm elected in November. I will begin this new chapter of public service in January. And in my career, I've learned that the decisions that judges make have long-lasting impacts and possibly permanent impacts on people's lives. My own marriage to my partner of 20 years was not recognized until a judge's decision made it so. Um, my wife's relationship to our daughter wasn't legalized until a judge's decision made it so. Um, the law has the ability to affect the real change for better or for worse. I've seen judges protect and create families, and I've seen judges tear them apart. And I've learned that I can be the best advocate for my clients as a lawyer, but it's the judge who will ultimately decide their fate. So we really need the best judges too. And we need a judiciary that includes people like me, and maybe even people like you. Um, so I hope you will find your own path to public service and meaningful work because we live in a world that needs you and the change that you can bring. And I wish you all success as you begin here in new leadership as hopefully embarking on your future of public service. So thank you again. <laughs> <Debbie>. <laughs> Sure, sure. <laughs> <Thank you>. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that I've learned about this class in particular is that they are really good question askers. Uh, oh, good. <laughs> and so I'm going to turn it over to them for a little bit um, and let them ask some questions. Susie, goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, so we're going to take a few minutes for questions. So I'm turning it over to all of you. Where, sorry, where's our mic runners? Oh, you can hear your questions. Oh, I don't know where Amarachi is. Okay, well. Okay. Say who you are and where you're from. Okay. Maybe stand up. Okay. Uh, I'm Jada. I go to the College of New Jersey. Um, if what is what is one thing you took from new leadership that you think you still use every day? That's a good question. So, um, I think it was confidence. You know, I feel like I left here with a renewed sense of confidence that I didn't have before this program. And I really think it was because, uh, because someone believed enough in me to allow me to be here. Um, and I think that's what you have to call upon on yourself when you're feeling down or defeated. You have to recall and get that back and go back to the place where someone chose you you know, to be here, that you're special, that you can make a difference, that you have potential. And never forget that, because there will always be times where it becomes really hard to believe that, and you gotta really believe that, so. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rachel Scabedo, and I am from the Middlesex County College. 
Um, I had a question for you, and it was, what kind of path do you think you've paved for other um, queer women in politics? Well, that's a great question. So I, I hope, I'd like to think I've paved a path, but I do have to give homage and thanks to those who have come before me. Because the one thing is that I am not the first um, out LGBT person to run for judge in Philadelphia, which is great to know. Um, there have been others. There's, a num there's actually, I think, five out lesbian judges in the Court of Common Pleas in Philadelphia. So I really had to, I went to them for mentorship, for advice. Um, I think I did it in a different way in that I, um, that wasn't necessarily the central part of my campaign. And I think one thing that I've realized, um, there, were, there were six out LGBT candidates running across uh, different offices in this past Philadelphia um, municipal primary election. I was the only one who won. And I was trying to figure out you know, what, how, what about my candidacy was a little bit different than how other people ran theirs. And I think it's important, at least for me, that my status as an out LGBT person was one facet of who I am, but not the sole message for my campaign. Um, because the other parts that were really important about who I was, that people were able to relate to, is that I'm a mom and I'm a parent to a 12-year-old daughter, that I've been very involved in public school activism and activist advocacy and access to public education within the city of Philadelphia. Um, which is a huge issue in our city, where a lot of people um, who have means opt out and go to private school. So being part of the public school activist community was a huge part of the support that I received. Um, being a Girl Scout leader, I have to say, my Girl Scout moms and troop leaders, <laughs> it's, a, it's an important network. <laughs> Um, so I think when you're running, you can't just rely on one community alone, you know, when you're running for office. You have to look at every community that you're a member of and you're a part of and make it about all of those things. So I have been very involved in LGBT rights activism, and that is definitely part of who I am, but there are other, lots of other parts because you have to be able to relate to all the people that are going to be coming before you when you run for public office. You have to show how you're not just there to help members of, say, the LGBT community or your own community. You're there to help the whole city and, and who, who, that, who those people are and how you can make sure that those, are, those people are protected as well. And for me, the message about uh, my work was really about the message of protecting modern families, which is a lot more expansive. And LGBT families are just one aspect of modern families because I can't tell you how many grandparents' rights cases I've had in the past year and aunts and uncles and kinship adoptions and custody cases and single parents. And there's so many ways that people form families. And we need to make sure that we're looking at family as a very broad category. And I think that message really resonated around the city and allowed me to connect with so many groups. So I think that's important, is, is to be out, you know, but also to be a part of a lot of communities, so. Hi, um, my name is Alex Anderson, I go to Rutgers, and I was wondering how you handled setbacks in your career when you lost a case, or even if a decision came down from a higher court that was negative towards the um, things that you were fighting for. You ask my wife about that, she's gonna. <laughs> I don't handle it well, no. <laughs> I don't like to lose. <laughs> um, I think that makes you fight harder to win, which is good, but it also means that you can take losses very hard and very personally. Um, and that's something you have to just kind of get through. For me, um, you have to try to realize that it's not personal, you know, especially with dealing with legal court cases. Your, your case is only as good as the facts that you have been given, and you can't change those facts. And sometimes those facts mean that you will lose no matter what kind of great advocate you are. Um, but it's hard not to take those things personally. I, it's something I struggle with. Um, <laughs> everyone was dreading what, what I'd be like if I didn't win the election. <laughs> or if I did. <laughs> so. <laughs> Maybe this is a question for her. No, um, 
Yeah, no, it's, it's really hard. I mean, the biggest loss that I had was um, in last year, in 2018, when I argued a case before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and it was brought to me as a losing case, and we pretty much knew we were going to lose, but I still thought that I could, you know, somehow make, make, it, make it happen. Um, and I didn't, and we lost. Um, there was still, uh, there were some good things about the case because they did, you know, correct some errors from the lower court, but ultimately my client lost her child. And um, the child that she lost was the same age as my own daughter. Um, and so it just felt very personal for me and very heartbreaking for my client because I wanted so badly for her to win. Um, you know, and, and part of the reason we lost was that the lower court, the trial court judge, um, criticized my client's delay in filing for custody. She waited almost 18 months of being separated from her child before she filed her custody complaint. Um, they believe the trial court judge interpreted that as a lack of interest or not really acting like a parent. But what the trial court judge failed to really understand was that my client lived in Florida, this is a different Florida case, and didn't actually know what her rights were. She didn't actually know that she could have filed for custody and that's why she delayed. And to me that said that the trial court judge really didn't have a cultural competence in fully understanding how LGBT people have been completely disenfranchised from an entire system of justice and courts for so long that they didn't even know they had rights to pursue. And I thought about what, how differently I would have been in that role to understand that difference of, you know, the reason for the delay. And that really kind of started to solidify in my mind that perhaps I did want to be a judge, um, that I would not make those same mistakes. So I think you learn from every loss that you have, from every case, and you just think about how you could do it differently or what else you could do better, or you know, what other change you want to make. And for me, that's really when I thought, you know, this is, the, this is maybe the time for me to do this, so. Okay, hi, my name is Tyra, and I'll be a sophomore at Swarman College in the fall. So I had a question for you. So I know a lot of women, whether they're a part of the LGBTQ, whether they're women of color, just women in general. So how have you in particular were able to digest the discrimination that may come with being a member of the LGBTQ, and how does that allow you to, how does that make, how has that made you stronger as you went along in your career? Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, there's always going to be, um, you know, facing that kind of discrimination. And for me, you know, um, it's also the discrimination you feel just as a woman in the profession sometimes. Um, people don't necessarily always take you seriously. People underestimate you. But sometimes I've found that being underestimated can be a secret weapon. Um, and I, you know, I, especially in this election, um, so many, you know, male political operatives really told me I had absolutely no chance. And they had no idea that what I had really going on in my campaign team and what we were putting together. And they were very surprised. Um, you know, and, you know, I think it, you just have to be yourself. Um, I think people respect it when you are yourself um, and take those risks that come with it. You know, and sometimes that means you may be treated poorly you know, you may be overlooked, um, and you just have to get right back up and keep on going, you know, and that's really, uh, for me, you know, I had a career path that was so entrenched in LGBT civil rights that I was surrounded, most of my coworkers were LGBT people. So, you know, I didn't work in a large firm, so I didn't, I didn't understand or face that kind of discrimination that many of my peers have, where they literally think they can't be out or they can't bring their spouse to a work function. You know, I, I didn't face that because I chose to surround myself almost entirely by queer people. <laughs> like my wife, who I met at work. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and that for me that's just because of the activism that I wanted to do. That's where I wanted to do it. But there's other people who are doing that kind of activism in the corporate world who are trying to make that change there, and it's working. It's, you know, um, there's been a huge sea change in corporate America where they're now sponsoring pride parades and whatnot, and that's um, because of the work that people have done just to be out. You know, sometimes the greatest political act that you can do is just to be yourself, so. <laughs> Hi, my name is Marika Egress from Moroni University, and um, my question is, what do you know, do um, know now that you wish you knew when you started your career or in college? 
Hmm, I wish I had had more financial literacy. <laughs> I, um, you know, I went to college um, and I was not, I did not have a good relationship with my parents at the time I left for college because I was coming out and we were very on different levels. And I, I kind of felt for many years that I was really on my own. Um, and I made a lot of mistakes financially that I wish I would have known. Um, that, that impacted, you know, a lot of my financial, you know, issues in my future. So, you know, fortunately I've been able to get beyond them and get where I am, but I really didn't understand about student loans, forbearance, compounding interest, things like that. Um, you know, and so I really wish I had had more financial literacy. I think it's important to understand, you know, what your opportunities can be and how you can reach your goals. Um, in light of your own personal circumstances. And, uh, you know, like many of us are not going to be able to rely on our parents. You have to do it yourself, and you need to know what kind of means you had. So I wish I had had that. Um, that's one thing where I really feel like I had a very big deficit. <laughs> so. oh, thank you. Uh, hi again. Um, <laughs> My, uh, I'm sorry, I'm Ladesha White, for those who may not know me, and I'm from Ramapo College of New Jersey. And my question is, in what ways do you believe you have changed the narrative of politics or politicians, per se, in your city? Okay. Well, I think because of the, camp the type of campaign that I ran, um, I ran a really unique um, grassroots campaign for judge, which no one had ever done before. Um, so I'd like to think that I have charted a new course for future progressive candidates who really want to run an information-based campaign based on merit. I was told so many times that you have to hire these particular political consultants that will get you these particular votes, and I didn't hire any of them. Um, I was told that you cannot win without the Democratic Party's endorsement. And I was told you cannot win without, you know, at least X amount of dollars. Um, you know, so I, I really wanted to believe that there was another way, you know. So I tried to work with uh, a political strategist to figure out exactly how many votes I needed to get and where we could get them. Um, and we did a very specific type of targeted campaign um, with progressive activists around the city and trying to mobilize uh, sort of a new movement and wing within the Democratic Party where people were essentially fighting against the machine and wanted to really uh, chart a new way, especially people who were particularly interested in criminal justice reform and family court reform. So I tried to really work with those communities and make those connections and be their candidate. And that really worked. And I'd like to think future candidates can run, you know, somewhat of an issue-based camp grassroots campaign by mobilizing activists to help them and to realize the importance of judges. I mean, this is a, a, um, a race in our city that's often overlooked. People understand mayor, they understand city council, but they don't really understand the importance of judges. But the judges that we elect in Philadelphia um, serve a 10-year term, and then they don't run for re-election, they run for retention. And no one has ever been voted out of a retention election. So the judges that are elected could potentially serve until age 75. So for many of us, that means you're electing someone who could be there for 30 years. Um, and that, how many families and how many lives can be affected with someone sitting on the bench for 30 years. So when you talk about the, the importance of you know, criminal justice reform and cash bail and all the issues that are affecting um, Philadelphia right now. And people, uh, Philadelphia is the highest rate of child removal in the country of taking a child away from a parent, placing that child in foster care. And you start talking about those issues and those are the issues that judges impact. Then you get people really mobilized to realize, I have to pay attention, this is important. And so we really countered the narrative that people don't care about judges and they're never gonna care about judges because we got them to care, so. I'm hoping candidates can do that as well in the future. So. Uh, my name is Jade, and I am going to be a senior at Rowan University. And I'm also just from outside of Philly in South Jersey, so I think it's amazing okay. that uh, you've made it this far. And <laughs> it would be awesome if you were elected to see somebody like you making decisions for Philadelphia. But my question was that what do you, if elected, what do you think you would bring 
as a judge that's maybe like makes you stand out or is different from the pattern of previous judges? So I really ran a campaign about um, family court reform because, you know, practicing in the Philadelphia family court system for 20 years, I learned a lot about what was missing, what was lacking, and how people were suffering as a result of our system. So I talked about that a lot on the campaign trail about what I would like to see and the changes I would like to see. And I think for me also as, as a woman and someone who represents what I call modern families, you know, I see a lot of, of the change that we need. From the very simple structural issues, like there is no designated breastfeeding room in that public building. And I have clients with infants who are expected to wait there all day long, and they're told to go feed their babies in the bathroom. To me, that's unacceptable. Um, and that's something that, you know, frankly, uh, a woman thinks about, you know, and, and that's where a woman is in power will actually be able to potentially say, we need to make this happen. Uh, I also represent clients where we have small children, two-year-olds, that are expected to wait for many, many hours while their case is getting called. There's no designated play area. There's nothing for kids in that building. I, you know, and I think that we could change that and make the whole space a lot more family friendly. And then with respect to the way that cases are scheduled, um, oftentimes there's so many continuances and delays that I've seen the impact of that where people essentially lose their child because it takes too long to get their day in court because the case gets continued and continued and continued and the child has been in foster care for so long that that clock starts ticking and then by the time they get their day in court, the child's already bonded with another family. Um, and that to me is unacceptable. We have to stop the delays that is causing people to lose their children or for cases to get continued where someone takes a day off work and waits there all day only to find out they have to come back again another day but they can't get another day off of work. So, you know, talking about the economic impact um, in our city and the social justice issues of that kind of reform. And, you know, things like um, making the forms gender neutral. You know, we have same-sex marriage now. There should never be a form that says husband and wife. There should never be a form that says mother and father when it can say parent and parent or parent one and parent two. Um, so those are the kinds of things where I think just having the perspective of someone like me can potentially give insight into the rooms where decisions are made, where people just may not have occurred to them. You know, it may not be outright purposeful discrimination, it just may not be something that they've experienced or even thought about. And that's where our voices, I think, can make a big difference.